Hey everybody, welcome to the recovery scene. I'm really excited about our first episode. If you like what you hear, make sure you hit that subscribe and that like button. I have my first ever guest, Kevin Parker. He is the author of the book, Winning Against All Odds, Discovering the True Warrior Within. He has been interviewed on a number of new shows, including Fox and Friends, NBC, CBS, etc. A lot of podcasts, the last one being um, Boston Marathon bomber survivor, Rebecca McGregory from Pain to Purpose. Thank you so much, Kevin. I'm so excited that you're here. Thank you. It's an absolute pleasure to be on your show. I'm so excited to be your first guest on your show. Uh, I'm really honored. I'm looking forward to this podcast. All right. Well, let me, I want to ask you something before we get started. I thought I would segue with this. So aside from liking to cook and, you know, work out and stuff like that. I have heard that you are a complete adrenaline junkie. Is this true? <laughs> yes, I certainly am. Uh, when I was an addict, I was an extremist in old fashioned. I loved the adrenaline rush. I wanted to go extreme, everything to the limit. And I just transferred that rush that I used to get from drugs and I do it naturally. I jump out of planes, I skydive, I uh, cliff jump, anything I can get. I love racing, uh, pretty much anything, climbing mountains, hiking, racing. all these different things. I didn't know about anything. racing. I mean, to quote Billy Crystal, if the parachute doesn't open, we can bury you in a Sucrets box. So that's no problem. <laughs> but I didn't know about racing. Yes. Like professional racing or, well, well not professional well, I'm racing. I'm actually in Arizona right now. Audi R8 it is a race car. And we go to the unlimited uh miles per hour areas in this in this area and we hit about 200 miles an hour so it's pretty exciting <laughs> oh God. yeah wow okay so you have been quoted as saying um and i might misquote you here so correct me i had to die to learn how to live or something along those lines tell us about that that was very true see Growing up, uh, I was an atheist. I had no hope. I was very, very pessimistic, and there was a, a cl dark cloud following me everywhere I went. Uh, the way that I filled this void in my heart was I started doing drugs. Mm -hmm. When I was a kid, I was bullied. Uh, I felt empty. I felt alone. And the only way that I can escape from this was drug use. Uh, I started smoking marijuana and drinking alcohol at the age of 10. Oh, wow. Became a habitual use by, by high gone. school. 14. Yeah, it was a long, a long road got me here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, by high school, I was doing just about every drug you could think of. And I was selling drugs just to get by. Mm -hmm. uh, I wasn't really living. I had this identity as a street kid that did drugs and sold drugs. And it really wasn't me, but it was the life that I was living. And it really consumed me. Right. I mean, in high school, I overdosed a few times, ended up in a seizure. I had a seizure on the baseball field of my high school team. Oh, wow. So you were still playing sports and everything while doing drugs? Ah, I was doing coke during the baseball games. Oh, wow. And uh, doing ecstasy during my football games. I was a full-blown drug addict. And when I turned 18 years old is when everything changed because I got hit by a bus. I injured my neck and my back, and I got severely addicted to painkillers. Mm. This is where my whole entire life spiraled out of, out of control. Right. I lost everything. Every friend I ever had, every relationship, all my confidence, dignity, every job. I lost my apartment, my car, and I ended up homeless. Wow. Yeah. Eventually, I had to move back in with my father. Mm. He let me stay for about six months until he gave me the ultimatum. And he said, Kevin, listen, you need help. Either get help or get out. In denial as a drug addict and being prideful, I told him I didn't need help and I left. Yep, yep. A lot of us do that, I think. So I stormed out the house. I grabbed my safe. I put it on my shoulder. And I walked about a half a mile to my friend's house and convinced his mother. To... And that night, I overdosed. They found me face first in my vomit, completely blue. Oh, rough. Yeah, uh, I, I spent the next month. Can I month ask real quick what you overdosed on? 
The world may never know, but at that time I was doing a lot of painkillers, Xanax. Gotcha. So I was taking Lyrica. It might have been a combination of all three. Uh, I couldn't really figure out what it was, but I, I believe it was a withdrawal aspect mm -hmm. of not having Xanax, not having painkillers, taking a lot of Lyrica. It was a really, it was a multi facet overdose. Right. But I was in too deep at that point. So I spent about a month in a coma in the ICU fighting for my life. Oh, wow. Three times now, in that did, hospital. Did, yes. um, did your body go septic? Oh yeah. That was, that was, that's in a little bit, but gotcha. getting to that, uh, I flatlined on the way to the hospital mm -hmm. and they got me in the hospital. I bled out. I ended up having multi-organ failure. My liver, my kidneys, my lungs, my heart, my brain, everything shut down. Jesus. I had 20% oxygen in my brain. It got so bad, I died three times. And the third time, they had a priest coming to read my last rites. Nothing short of a miracle. With no warning in sight, I just woke up. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's a miracle. Died three times. It's too bad you don't remember any of it. That could be a whole Oh, I do. Book. I actually put it in the book. <laughs> oh, you are putting it. Okay, cool. Yes. <laughs> See, I'm right there with you. <laughs> yeah, uh, it was a really, a really amazing experience when I was in that coma. It's a, it's a lot of detail to go into here, but if you read the book, you'll. And you'll, it's out now. Your book's out uh, now. It's, it's, it's going to be out. It's, okay. it's finished. I'm in the publishing process. It's going to be released in March. Oh, cool! I can't wait. But it's all written and everything is ready to go. We're going to the international market, and we're trying to spread this book all around the world because it, there's a message in it that everybody needs to hear. Right. Okay. So you woke up. That's like really step one. <laughs> Yeah. That's just the beginning. Yeah. The first thing I seen was my mother's face. And let me tell you, that was the worst guilt and shame I've ever felt in my life. I mean, she looked like she gained, she lost 10 years from the last time I seen her. Her face was wrinkled. She had gray hair. She was like really troubled. Mm -hmm. And at this moment I realized I did that. And it was a horrible feeling to make your mother look like that and feel like that way. Yeah. As a mother myself, I can understand how how yeah. painful that would be to watch yeah, your child my... die. You <laughs> literally watch your child die. Yeah, it was my worst nightmare. And on top of that, I hear the doctors say things like, his brain is frying. He has 108 fever. 108 fever. Oh, my gosh. I had no oxygen in my brain. My blood pressure plummeted. My liver and kidneys wasn't filtering my body fast enough so my blood became toxic and I developed sep sep sepsis. So my blood, my blood was septic to my body. I was poisoning myself. I had infections all over the place. And at one point I was supposed to lose all four of my limbs and be completely brain dead if I survived. And it was a small if, if I was going to survive. Right, right. Yeah. So all four were supposed to come off. <laughs> yeah. When I heard this, I started to pray. <laughs> Hard. <laughs> you know, there's, no, there's no atheist in a foxhole. Well, I was in a really bad shape and I, I didn't know what to do, but I was just, I was just praying for a second chance. And I was asking if I can get through this, I promise I learned my lesson. Mm. I promise I'll change. I'll do better. I'll help people. I'll do whatever I can. I was pleading and begging. This went on for weeks. There was no signs of relief. I thought I was going to die until one day the doctor came in and said, Kevin, I got some good news and I got some bad news. The good news is I think you're going to make it. The bad news is we're going to have to take your leg. Mm. This was a shock to me because I was a sports player my whole life. Right. And I couldn't really believe it. I didn't actually, actually hit me as reality until I seen the nurses pull up the sheet and my leg was missing. I thought it was a joke to have me on so many medications. Oh, it wow. almost seemed like a fantasy land. But that's when reality kicked in. Uh, I lost my leg. I had complete nerve damage in my hand, drop wrist. I was supposed to never be able to move my hand again. And I was weighing 100 pounds. I'm 220 at this point. Right. Oh, wow. So I was yeah. skin and bones. I mean, it was, it was a. So they were betting against me. Everybody was betting against me except my family. And right. thank God I had such an amazing support system because I wouldn't be here. Yeah, you keep freezing on and off, but that's all right. Um, yeah, I think 
one thing that people really take for granted that is so important in the healing process once we stop using is the support system how important mm. that support system is because trying to do it by yourself not that it's impossible but it is hard i can't imagine either because i also had a very good support system yeah i i was in a place where i couldn't even i couldn't change myself i couldn't bathe myself i couldn't get up the stairs i couldn't walk and without them i would have died right but right. I, I thought all of this was going to be so hard. I had to learn how to breathe again. Oh, wow. They would take me off of oxygen just enough so I wouldn't die, but give me just enough oxygen so I had to struggle to breathe for weeks on end. It was like being waterboarded. Oh, wow. For, for weeks, it was torture. Uh, and I had all kinds of different complications in the hospital. I bled out a few times. My, my father saved my life. He looked under the blankets, and I was in about three inches of blood. Oh, wow. Uh, I had to learn how to talk walk, eat again, breathe again, drink again. I didn't have anything to eat or drink for about three months. Let me tell you, the first time I had a sip of Gatorade, I should have did a Gatorade commercial because I, I felt like I had an <laughs> orgasm. It was out of control. <laughs> it was the, the facial expression on me could have sold a million had. bucks. <laughs> what? The best thing I've ever had. Yeah, it was pretty incredible. Oh but gosh. the physical, pretty traumatic, but... Mm -hmm. As most addicts know, the mental and emotional aspect of recovery is so much more deeper and powerful and harder to get through. It is. Uh, I got home, although I was broken physically, I was a wreck motion, emotionally because all of my friends were either drug, drug addicts or drug dealers. I had no friends left. I had no career. I ruined every relationship in my life. I had nothing. I didn't know what I was going to do. I lost my career. I was a union worker making 100 grand a year. Right, that right. Uh, my whole life was turned upside down. I had a whole nother identity and I had to kick painkillers, cold turkey in my room, broken. Right. Now, I don't know if everybody hearing this podcast ever tried to kick painkillers, cold turkey, but it's like having the most severe flu you can think of and having every physical, mental, and emotional pain that you've ever had hit you all at once and trying right. to deal with that at the same time. It's, uh, it's absolute torture. So be lean on anybody that you know that's going through it because it's a really, really tough decision to make and it's a very tough battle to go through. It is. It is. And cold turkey. Yeah, that's, yeah. Yeah. yeah I came off um, opiates cold turkey. And it was, <laughs> it was not fun at all. At You're part all. of that crew, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Part of that club. <laughs> and that'll toughen you up, you yeah. know, but yeah, it was. It, it, it was painful and it just, it, it was more than a little embarrassing at times and just gross. Yeah. No, thank you. No, yeah. thank you. But it was worth it. I mean, you know, I don't want to freak anybody out about, about quitting. You know, it was absolutely worth it. It was the yeah. best thing that ever happened to me. You don't oh, yeah. know freedom until you're a slave to addiction. I always say that because it's the truth. When you wake up the first time after months or years on end, your, your addiction, making your decision, and you get up and you get to choose what you want to do that day. That is the most liberating feel in the whole world. And I wish everybody can experience that kind of liberation and freedom. Yeah. It's, it's nothing you'll ever even be able to compare to if you never did drugs. And it's something you can only dream of if you're still doing drugs. And I, and I highly, highly recommend anybody going through it to fight that battle because the light is truly brighter on the other side. <laughs> It I mean, really is. I mean, you just have so much more once you learn, cause it is a process. It's learning how to live all over again, you know, because you had, you never really had to deal with emotions or life issues or a lot of things because, you know, I, for myself, I ran to a drug or I escaped in alcohol, you know, and, but once you learn how to live again, it, little things, you know, I still say, I never, I never thought I would be excited about doing, you know, this, just, just simple things, you know, just hanging out with my family or things I would never have been able to do had I not cleaned up, 
mm. and, and gone through that pain and gone through that. It's a learning process. Frankly, it's a learning process. It's a, big, it's a hell of an education. Yeah. <laughs> it really is. So tell us about your life now. Like once you really started, well, not now, but you know, once you really started coming out on the other side. So they strongest warriors come from the deepest, darkest depths of hell. Mm -hmm. uh, I had to claw my way out of the darkest place I've ever been in. I had to learn how to walk. My girlfriend left me the first day I came home. Oh. I was alone. I was broken. I had to gain back all my weight. I had to will my hand back to life. I still stared at my hand for about six months until I, my fingers started moving. The doctors told me I was never going to be able to move my hand again. I was going to take two years to learn how to walk. And I looked at each one of them and said straight up, listen, no offense, but don't tell me what I'm going to do. I'll show right. you. Right. You and just reminded me of uh, Kill Bill. You remember Kill yeah, Bill? Yeah, that's exactly. <laughs> and she's telling her big toe to move? Use that up. I always use that example when she stares at her big toe and she wiggles it because that's exactly what it was. It's like, yeah. I got this, I got all day. Uh, I'm not moving until you move your finger. And, and once it moved, that's all I needed to know that I knew it was possible. Right. See, when you go through something this devastating, you have two options. You can wallow in self-pity or you can use all these trials and tribulations as rocket fuel to ignite a passion in you like nothing before. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's and I chose the latter, but it was difficult. Uh, I had to reinvent myself from the ground up. I felt like I was reborn at 26 years old. Wow. I didn't know what I was going to do. I went back to college. I wanted to be a doctor, actually, because all the doctors saved my life. Mm -hmm. I actually got straight A's in, in high, college, although I was a straight C student in high school when I was on drugs. Yeah, Little did I, I know I had some brains in my head. Uh, yeah. I actually wanted to be a doctor, but then halfway through it, just about at the end of my bachelor's, I realized that I did not want to go to 10 years of schooling. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I was going to do the PA route, the NP, but I found my place in the recovery field because mm -hmm. it's so much more real to me. Yeah. I've been there, done that. I can add value to this in so many different aspects. And my life changed forever when I started reading all these terrible stories in the, in the newspaper and I wrote my story to the news and they decided to publish it on the front page of the advance, the Sunday advance. Wow. And at that wow. point, yeah, a bunch of different organizations reach out to me and they asked me if I'd speak at their events. Now at this time, I never spoke at anything in my life, not even in front of class. Right. So I was terrified, but I knew that people needed to hear what I had to say. So I went up there the first time, glasses on, fogging up, stuttering, shaking, sweating. A uh, little crumpled up piece of paper stuttering the whole time. And I got through the whole thing and I got a standing ovation. And nice. all the kids in the audience came up to me to hug me and thank me. And they were crying. And it was the most moving experience in my life. And what I realized is wow. that's really cool. When you can turn your biggest weaknesses into your biggest strengths, you are unstoppable. Mm -hmm. That's when exponential things happen. Uh, that's where you find your purpose. See, if I can save one life from going through what I went through, mm -hmm. what I put my whole entire family through, then every single thing I went through was all worth it. That's powerful. That's yeah. powerful. Yeah. So at that point, I decided to get rid of the doctor dreams, and I started grabbing all kinds of different certifications in the recovery field. I actually became a life coach. I went to Tony Robbins events. Unleash the Power Within, Date with Destiny, Life and Wealth Mastery. Uh, I went to John Maxwell events, Mary Morrissey. I, I just Maxwell. became <laughs> yeah, John Maxwell, one of my favorites. That's when I first got certified as a life coach. Okay. Uh, I just became a self development junkie. I knew I was an extremist. I knew I had to do things to the extreme. Right. And I started to focus my energies on things that were more productive and positive. And that's why I like to work with people in recovery and addicts because they just have so much resourceful energy and creativity and personality in them. They just focused it in the wrong direction. Right. That right. up. And I find they're the most resourceful, unique people to work with because they're just, they're dynamic. They're versatile. They've had so much experiences. And if you can focus 
all those skills and talents into the right place, they're unstoppable. Yeah, I, so I, I started, remember listening to a man and he had, he was a speaker at a convention and he had said something like, it will be storming outside. We have a bike with two flat tires. We've got 60 cents in our pocket. And you had better believe that by five o'clock, we will have figured out a way to get money and get to where we're going and get what we need. If we could take just 5% of that kind of dedication and put it into something productive, we would all be millionaires. We'd all be successful. And That's so great. That is, that is a great line right there. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely right. You're right. Yeah, yeah that, it's amazing what you're, what you're capable of. It's just focused in the right direction. And I just started reading every book I can read. I've read probably over 250 books in my life in self-development and biographies and all these different things. I don't remember all of it, but I read it and right. I started, at least if I learned one or two things each book, it started adding value in my life. I started hanging around people that I wanted to be like. Mm -hmm. right. And I started to get specialized knowledge. See, specialized knowledge is one of the most important things because that's where value comes from. And I started taking classes and seminars on things that I really wanted to get good at. Right. Right. Uh, I partnered up with the addiction. You froze for just Academy. a second. Okay. So you partnered up with the Addictions Academy. I partnered up with the Addictions Academy. I got a recovery coach certification, drug intervention, family coach, and neuroscience, uh, sober companionship, um, nutrition coaching. I have like nine different coaching certifications through the Addictions Academy. Mm -hmm. And I partnered up with the owner, Dr. Callie Estes. And uh, she taught me how to teach the recovery coaching class. And I teach the life coaching class as well through that school, that oh, online yeah. school as well. For those that don't know, uh, Kevin was actually my instructor <laughs> becoming a certified recovery coach. One now, of my favorite students. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Although I did text you, I remember one time <laughs> we had to go through and figure out how we would help different people. And I, I texted you and I said, I am fairly sure I've just killed everyone. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. Nobody gets it right the first time. You did very well. But it was it it is it's a great academy. It's a great and uh, actually uh Dr. SS has agreed to be on our podcast. So I'm really excited about that too. Oh, excellent. I'm about that too, but Very cool. Yeah. Yeah, that's Now do you have did I did you get your masters or did you stop at your bachelors? Why did I So I got my bat I just got my bachelors. Okay. I was going to get my I decided I was going to go get my masters in social work but that, that's what you had told me that's right i had enough knowledge doing all the certifications that i did and there's more restrictions with social work and all that i like right and be able to do it the way that i want to do it because i've been very very effective on getting people sober and clean and helping them create a life that they love to live so what they say is uh if it's don't if it's not broken don't fix it right and i'm doing a very very good job helping people get sober helping people find their way in life, creating a, a sober, sustainable life that they can live with and they can be happy and content with. And the efficacy rate that I have with my clients is amazing. So uh, I just, I'm just continuing to learn, learn more modalities, learn more techniques and tools and resources for my clients. And I just really love what I do. There's nothing like changing somebody's life for the better. Right, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, let me ask you this. Um, Going into the holidays, mm -hmm. that's always really tough, you know, for, uh, for addicts and alcoholics, et cetera, et cetera. What, what would you tell somebody going into the holidays? You know, we tend, a lot of relapsing happens. What advice would you give to somebody who might struggle at this time of year? Uh, the best advice I can tell you is addiction is, is a norm now. It's not something you have to sweep under the rug. It's not something you have to hide. It's openly acceptable in society now. So if you have a problem, if you're sad, if you're depressed, you know, we are in the society of, of acceptance of everything. It's true. And there are so many resources out there, so many tools, free, free, paid, coverage it doesn't matter there's so many resources out there for people that want to help you not to mention your family and friends if you're feeling like you really want to use talk to somebody 
just tell somebody because accountability is one of the most powerful tools in sobriety. Having yeah. somebody there aware that you're feeling weak, that can spend time with you, that can make sure that you don't do anything is the best tool for you not to use. And there are people that care about you. You, you may not even think the people around you care about you. There are strangers that care about you, that lost family members or kids or sons or daughters that they would do anything in the world because they want to help you. Like you don't understand the effect. And more people care about you than you think. So reach out to somebody, reach out to me. I'll talk to you. Right. I don't want to see anything happen to any of you. It's not necessary. And I mean, Kevin's available. He's on TikTok. He's on Instagram. He's on Facebook. Are you at LinkedIn? I think. Are you on yeah. I'm, uh, I'm more, I'm more active on Facebook uh, and TikTok, mm -hmm. Instagram, but I'm on LinkedIn as well. Whatever, whatever thing you can also go to my website, truewarriorsuccess.com. All of my contact information is on there. Um, and a part of my book is out there. Uh, yeah, I'm very easy to reach. I mean, there's just so many resources. Reach out to reach out to you. Yeah. You're an excellent resource. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you, you know, can uh, me at the the clean crew zero one at gmail.com. I'm also on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. Yeah. So yeah, it's not hard to get a hold of me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a whole other crowd that you can reach that I can't reach, and vice versa. Right. So, like right. I said, there's just so many people that care and want to help you. Don't be a stranger. Don't. Don't be a lone ranger. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes even just putting a voice to what you're feeling. Yeah. You know, makes a huge difference instead of just keeping that all inside and trying to deal with it all yourself. Yeah. You know, it really is. It's, uh, it's just, a, it's amazing how much just talking it out or getting it out. Listen, even, even simple things like, it sounds silly, but going for going for a walk or a bike ride, mm -hmm. being out in nature, yeah, taking you deep breaths. Motion creates emotion. Yeah, one yeah. of my favorite lines. It's true. <laughs> it's sitting up, if you're sitting up and you, if you're laying in your own filth and you're just sitting there and you're moping, ch chances are you're going to be down and sad. You yeah. want to use. Mm -hmm. Get up, make a move. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. You know, I tell them, I'm like, I don't care if you arrange your drawers by color, you know, <laughs> whatever you got to do, just do something, you know, yeah. take a shower. Just sometimes just, we have, you know, you, especially when we get depressed and everything, we haven't showered in like three, maybe four days. We feel so much better when we take that shower, you know, it's simple stuff. Just little simple things can really make a huge, huge difference, you know? Yeah. So it's the little things that matter the most. It, it really is. It really is. So, but if, if you're really serious about sobriety, I, I really suggest if it's possible for you hire a recovery coach because uh, recovery coaches are a multifaceted customizable approach mm -hmm. to bring you specifically from exactly where you are to exactly where you want to be. Right. Whatever that might be. There's so many different roads to recovery. Uh, I know AA works for some people, smart recovery works for some people, harm reduction, uh, spiritual uh, recovery, Christian recovery, Jewish recovery, all these different aspects. They have all kinds of different recovery models. Don't let anybody shame you into thinking one is better than the next. Whatever it takes to get you where you need to go to live a healthy life is okay. Right. There are a lot, there are not just only, you know, there's not just one road to recovery. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of a lot of highways that'll get you there, you know, yeah. and a recovery coach will come help you come up, help you come up with a plan, you know, that, that fits you and your personality and where you want to go. And help you execute it. Exactly. Yep. And help you get there. All right. Hold on. Okay. There we go. <laughs> it's because Kevin is in the Arizona and uh, we're kind of, Horning in on his vacation. <laughs> yeah, moment. that's why I'm uh, I'm kind of wobbling around. I don't have my my lights up right now. That's I'm, all right. Uh, I'm going off the cuff. Right, and the the casino is calling his name. 
I heard that. I'm not a gambler. I, I I don't have that addiction. I'm done. I went. I went. I went just to say I went. I lost 150 bucks in 30 minutes, and now I'm done. Oh, <laughs> the only thing I ever do when I have gone is I'm the slot machine person. And I suck at it. Yeah, out. I lost 100 bucks in 15 minutes. And not even 10 minutes in the slot machines. Oh my god. Yeah, it's it's out of control. I, I hate I hate gambling. Yeah. I um, watched my father on the bar when I was younger, and I used to watch people gamble their lives away. So. Ah. Uh, I go. I'd never been to an Indian reservation, and they took my money and and uh, le left me with a bad taste in my mouth. But that's good because if I would have won the first time, I'd be going back with the right. itch. Right. Right. I can do it more money. Like it's I free. can do it. Just one more. Yeah. Always just one more. Always one more. No matter what your addiction is. See, what I like to tell people is, uh, whether you're dealing with addiction or somebody you know, loved one, somebody you care about dealing with addiction. I'm here to tell you very boldly that we're all addicts. Mm -hmm. Now, and if you don't believe me, do you like shopping? Do you eat a lot of food? Do you like have sex a lot? Do you have anything that you overly do, you're addicted to. And on top of that, we are all addicts of pleasure. Just because your favorite flavor of pleasure is different than mine does not make you any different. Mine may be more destructive. Mine maybe isn't the one that I shouldn't be using. The fact of the matter is I'm chasing the same exact thing that you're chasing. I just found it in a different flavor. And it may be a little more toxic. And a little, uh, I'm, I'm trying to live life just like you, like every other addict. And some people take different paths and they take some wrong turns and everything. Really want to help change the stigma of addiction because... Yeah. When you realize that it could be you or your mother or your father or your understanding that. Yeah. Yeah. It, it doesn't discriminate. It doesn't, yeah. you know, we think of the scary people addict or, you know, the person that people see on the street that they love to shame, you know, the person that they love to shame, that they like to record and, you know, don't think for a second that, that there are no nevers, there are only not yets. And don't think for a second that that cannot be you or someone you love somewhere down the line. Yeah. You know, our ego is kind of getting in the way of being able to accept that, but it, that's the absolute truth. There are no nevers, there are only not yets, yes. period. Love so, that. Yeah, so thank you so much for letting us, you know, take you from your vacation. I love Arizona. Uh, I'm, I'm going to move out here. Actually, that's what I'm planning to do. I'm looking to buy a property out here. So it's the oh, next very move. cool. Very yeah. cool. I'll get to visit you when I go visit my cousins. That'd be great. Ah, you are always welcome. Awesome. <laughs> very cool. Thank you so much, Kevin. Thank you. It was an absolute pleasure. Good luck with the podcast. And she rocks. I hope you guys follow her. Click like, subscribe, and uh, hopefully I'll see you around the bend. All right. Thank you. Take care.